If you have your Bible with you, please get that back out again and go into your Old Testament. We're going back to our Old Testament, to the book of 2 Chronicles. I want to ask you to go to 2 Chronicles, the ninth chapter. We're going to read some passages from 2 Chronicles chapter 9 in just a moment. As you turn there and get settled in and ready to study, let me just remind you of something very, very important going on this week here at Monta Vista. Starting tomorrow at 7 o'clock, we're going to be having some special studies, some special classes for our young people. There's either going to be a class going on here in the auditorium for the adults that our shepherds are going to be teaching, and these lessons are going to be about Jesus, helping us learn more about Jesus. And I certainly hope that if you're able to, please come out and support this effort this week. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be exciting. Please bring your children, bring your grandchildren. If you don't have children or grandchildren, just come and bring yourself and come into the auditorium. We're going to be having classes Monday through Friday starting at 7 o'clock this week. And there's just going to be a wonderful time of spiritual feasting. And I certainly hope and pray that, that all of us can be able to support that effort. Are you in 2 Chronicles chapter 9? Let's start with verse number 3. In verse number 3, the Bible says, When the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house which he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his ministers and their attire, his cupbearers and their attire, and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, she was, she was breathless. And she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came. And my eyes had seen it, and behold, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You surpassed the report that I heard. Have you ever experienced something that exceeded your expectations? You ever experienced something that exceeded your expectations? Many of you here know that when it comes to Sean Jeffries, Sean Jeffries is, well, he's a cheeseburger guy. Many of you here know that about me. Many of you here know that I, if I didn't discipline myself, I literally eat a good cheeseburger every single day of the week, every single day of the year. I love me a good cheeseburger, and back in 2018, when we visited the West Coast for the first time, we were told by some people in the congregation that we were laboring with in Middle Tennessee that there was a good cheeseburger that we needed to try. They said that when we go out to the West Coast, there was a, a, a popular fast food burger chain. Now, you may have heard of it before. It is called, was called in and out You ever heard of in and out before? Well, let me tell you something, prior to 2018, we had never heard of in and out before. Those things don't exist in the South where we come from. Our friends who visited the West Coast, they told us about this place. They told us that in and out has some good cheeseburgers for a reasonable price. And while I was skeptical at first that in and out was gonna be as good as they pumped it up to be, once we got to Los Angeles, and we found us in and out and we tried their cheeseburger. Well, we were, we were, we were impressed. It was pretty good. It wasn't quite on the level of a water burger, but it, <laughs> it lived up to the hype. It met my expectations. In fact, it actually exceeded our expectations. And while there were no in and out burgers in the land of Israel 3,000 years ago, they did have something, something much better. They did have one of the great wonders of the ancient world. They did have the glorious temple of God that had been constructed under the leadership of King Solomon. The temple of God was in Israel 3,000 years ago when the Queen of Sheba had heard about the temple of God and she traveled from her country from Jerusalem or to Jerusalem to see it. She wanted to gaze her eyes on it and see if it lived up to its reputation. When she saw the temple firsthand, she was amazed. 
She was completely blown away. She was in awe of Solomon's wisdom and his kingdom and his prosperity and the temple. All of that exceeded her expectations. And I'm pretty sure that if we were part of her entourage on that occasion, it would have exceeded our expectations as well. As Brother Dave read for us this morning in our scripture reading, the temple constructed under the, under the leadership of Solomon was a truly magnificent structure. It was something that was built by the most skillful craftsmen using the finest wood and the finest materials. Lavish amounts of silver and gold were used for its construction. The walls inside of it were overlaid with pure gold. The doors were gold. The sacred furniture inside of it, the flooring, the porch area, all of that stuff was overlaid with pure gold. Solomon spared no expense when it came to building the temple of God. The question, though, is, is who else besides Solomon? And besides God, who is the giver of all things, besides God and Solomon, who else was responsible for for the temple's grandeur. Who else was responsible for its excellence? Who else was responsible for the temple becoming the greatest architectural, I knew I was gonna mess that up, architectural achievement, you try saying that, architectural achievement in antiquity? Well, the answer to that is actually found back in the book of First Chronicles. When you go in your Bible to First Chronicles this morning, our lesson, our lesson is going to primarily be coming from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, we're going to be reading several passages from 1 Chronicles chapter 29 today. And before we read those passages, if you don't mind, give me a moment or two to kind of set up the context. Let me set up the context for what's going on there in that chapter. In the context of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, we need to understand that Solomon... Solomon has not yet ascended to the throne. Solomon has not yet become the king of Israel. Instead, his father, David, his father, David, is, is the king of Israel. David is still the most powerful man in the land of Israel. In fact, what we find here is towards the end of his reign. His reign as king is dwindling. It is, it is reaching an end, and after gathering an assembly of his officials together, he talks with them about the temple. He talks with them about the temple yet to be built. He tells them that while God picked his young and inexperienced son Solomon to build the temple, he wanted to do all he could to ensure its success. He wanted to secure financing for the temple. And he also wanted to gather important resources for its construction. And most importantly, he wanted to motivate and encourage these people to also be zealous and excited and involved in this work. In fact, there are at least four reasons. There are at least four reasons that David gives these people for why they should be zealous and excited and involved in the work of building the temple. And the first reason was because of this. The first reason why these people needed to be involved in the work of the temple was because of who it was for. Because it was, it was for God. That's what we find in the first verse of the chapter. Notice how in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse number 1, the Bible says, then King David said to the entire assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen is still young and inexperienced and the work is great. Now notice how David describes the work of building the temple. He describes it as a great work. Why was it a great work? Well, he tells us, for the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Here we see, we see exactly who the temple was going to be for. Notice how David says that the temple 
was going to be for God. It was going to be for the Lord God. It wasn't going to be for him. It wasn't going to be for David or for Solomon or even for the people of Israel. It wasn't just going to be another palace or fortress in Israel. It wasn't just going to be another building with a roof and walls and rooms. No, David says that this structure, this building was going to be for the king, the king of the universe. It was going to be for the creator and the sustainer and the redeemer. That is why they needed to take part in its construction. That is why they needed to be excited and passionate about this work. That is why they needed to sacrifice and give generously to support this work. That is the main thing that David is talking about in this chapter. As we continue reading this chapter for the next few minutes, we're going to see that in the context, in the context of this chapter, David is trying to urge his people to give. He's trying to urge them to give generously to support the building of the temple. He knows that just like anything else in life, the temple can't get built without money. The temple can't get built without supplies and physical resources. David knows that if God is truly going to be glorified and honored by this building, then they were first going to have to honor God by their giving. They were first going to have to honor God by giving back to him a portion of the blessings that he had given them. They were going to have to first understand that using their physical resources to honor God, well, that was the best thing they could ever do with those resources. David wanted these people to really, to really understand that this was going to be for God. And the question is, do we, under, do we understand the same thing? Do we understand the same thing as a, as a local congregation of God's people? Do we understand that the work we are doing as a local congregation of God's people is a work that is for God? It is a work that is for a great God. Do we understand this when it comes to our giving? Do we understand that each and every time that collection basket passes in front of us on the Lord's day, the money we put in there isn't just for helping keep the lights on. It isn't just for contributing to the financial support of preachers like me and Brian and other men who preach the gospel. It isn't just money that we're going to use to buy more communion packets and to maintain our website. No, above anything else, the money we give in those baskets is money for God. It is money for a great God. It is a demonstration of just how much we respect and just how much we are invested in the work of a great God. Do we understand this when it comes to our giving? And do we also understand this when it comes to our singing? When we sing songs together, when we gather together as a congregation, do we understand that those songs we are singing are first and foremost to God? Our partaking of the Lord's Supper is first and foremost to God. Our prayers, our daily Bible reading, our listening to preaching and teaching, our acts of service, even the way we conduct ourselves on a daily basis, all of that stuff is first and foremost to God. I'm going in my Bible to Romans. Keep your place in 1 Chronicles 29. We're going to come back there. But in Romans, do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1? Remember what Paul said, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, after Paul talks about the, the blessings that we enjoy because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your, to present your bodies. As a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, notice, by the renewing of your mind, so that you will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice how Paul says that everything we are about, 
Everything that we do or don't do with our spiritual talents, everything that we even do in our daily lives should be for God. It should be a demonstration of, of how much we love God and how much we respect God and revere God and how much we appreciate what God has done for us and what he continues to do for us every single day. David wanted the people of Israel to understand that. He wanted them to be excited and zealous about doing work in the kingdom or for God because this temple was going to be for God. It was going to be for the Lord God. In fact, since it was for the Lord God, David wanted them to know that it required excellent effort. Excellent effort. Go back to 1 Chronicles again, please. Look at verse number 2. After David says that the temple was not going to be for man, but it was going to be for the Lord God. Well, in verse number two, he goes on to say, First Chronicles 29, verse two. Now, with all my ability, I, I have provided for the house of my God, the gold for the things of gold. And the silver for the things of silver and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron and wood for the things of wood, onyx stones and inlaid stones, stones of antimony and the stones of various colors and all kinds of precious stones and alabaster in abundance. Moreover, in my delight and the house of my God, the treasure I have of gold and silver I give to the house of my God over and above all that I have, that I have already provided for the holy temple. Again, in the context in the context of these verses, David is talking about giving. He's talking about giving. He's telling the people that when it came to building the temple, he gave out of his own pocket to help with this project. He says that he went above and beyond with his giving. In fact, some scholars estimate that the money David personally gave out of his own bank account to support this effort could have been equivalent to a couple of a billion dollars in our money today. Even for a king, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that David gives out of his own bank account to help support this effort. And the reason why he does that is because, again, this temple was for God. This temple was for his God. That's what he says in verse number two. Now, with all my ability, I have provided for the house of my God. Verse three, moreover, in my delight in the house of my God. I really like that language, don't you? I love it. I love that language David uses there. I love it because it shows us that not only did David love God and not only did David want to honor God, but he also knew that God loved him. He also knew that God knew him personally and God cared about him personally. He also knew that God wasn't just the God of the nation of Israel, but he was also his God. He was also his creator and his sustainer and his redeemer. Do you see that? David understood the truth about his relationship with God, that reality motivated him to really take part and give God excellent effort in this work. The question is, do we feel the same way as David did? Do we have the same kind of attitude, the same kind of spirit as David? Like David, do we also love God? Do we really love God? Do we really want to honor God? Do we really believe that God is real and he is excellent and he personally knows and, and loves and cares about us? I want to suggest that if we really believe that with all our hearts, then we have no choice but to do what David did, and that is give God excellent effort in everything that we do. That is, be willing to go above and beyond in our efforts to serve the Lord in his kingdom. That's exactly the point that Jesus wanted the church in Laodicea to understand in Revelation chapter 3. If you remember in Revelation 3, Jesus rebuked the church in Laodicea because they had become, well, they had become lukewarm. They had become kind of indifferent towards the Lord's work. They, they were riding the fence. Jesus wanted them to understand that that kind of spirit, that kind of attitude wasn't going to cut it in the eyes of God. 
It reminds me of what Paul said to the Thessalonians. Will you go in your Bible, please? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verse number 1. Notice carefully the language that Paul uses here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction... As to how you walk, ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk. They are walking right. They're pleasing God. But Paul says that you, that you excel still more. Drop down to verse number nine. In verse number nine, he goes on to say, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, for indeed you do practice it. You're doing this. You are loving one another, for indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Notice that language Paul uses there. Excel. Excel still more. The idea of excelling still more means that as God's people, we got to always strive to give God our best effort. We got to always strive to grow and do better for the Lord when it comes to serving God. We got to have a mentality of good enough. It's never good enough. It's never good enough. For a wonderful and an excellent God, God deserves nothing less than excellent effort from those who have been redeemed by the blood of his son. He deserves, he deserves passionate and enthusiastic worship. He deserves heartfelt singing and thoughtful prayers and intense concentration when we listen to preaching and teaching and when we uh, observe the Lord's Supper. He also deserves generous and sacrificial giving. He also deserves our first fruits. He deserves far more than us just giving him whatever is left over after we make sure we have all of our streaming channels that we want. And after we make sure we can eat out four or five times a week. No, God deserves better than that. God deserves our best effort when it comes to our worship. And he also deserves our best effort Whenever we render an act of service. I don't care what service we're talking about in the kingdom of God. I don't care if it's volunteering and teach a, a Bible class. Or preaching a sermon or being part of a work group or being a church leader or making copies for Bible class material. Or even if it's just taking out the trash around here and cleaning the toilet. Because what we are doing for, for God is part of his work. Well, well, he deserves, he deserves excellent effort in everything that we do. He deserves nothing but the best. He deserves diligence and seriousness and an attitude of whatever I'm doing, I'm going to go above and beyond for the Lord. Solomon, the son of David, was the one who wrote in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, whatever your hands find to do, do it how? With all your might. That's what David is talking about here. That's what David did on this occasion. That's what David, that's the kind of spirit he had when he came to building a temple that he would never even see. David gave God excellent effort when it came to taking part in building the temple. But not only did he give God excellent effort, he also gave God a willing heart. A willing heart. We go back to 1 Chronicles again, please. Chapter 29, we pick up. Let's go back to verse 3, verse 3, then we'll read down to verse number 9. In 1 Chronicles 29 and verse number 3, David says, Moreover, in my delight in the house of my God, the treasure I have of gold and silver, I give to the house of my God. Over and above all that I've already provided for the holy temple, namely 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the buildings of gold for the things of gold and of silver for the things of silver. That is for all the work done by the craftsmen who then is willing, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord. Then the rulers of the father's households and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands and of hundreds with the overseers over the king's work offered willingly. 
And for the servants of the first for the service of the house of God, they gave five thousand talents, and ten thousand darks of gold, and ten thousand talents of silver, and eighteen thousand talents of brass, and a hundred thousand talents of iron. Whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord and the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Verse nine. Then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly. For they made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart. And King David also, he rejoiced greatly. Notice how in addition to wanting to honor God, another reason why David gave so much from his own personal bank account was because he wanted to set an example. He wanted to set an example for the people of Israel. Think about who David is. David is the king. He is the king of the entire nation of Israel. You know what that means? That means that if David wanted to, he could have secured financing for Solomon to build the temple by just taxing these people. He could have just taxed them like crazy. He could have forced them to take part in helping build this temple, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't tax these people like crazy. He doesn't force them to get involved in this work. Instead, he sets an example of generous giving and service to God. And then he leaves it up to them to decide if they want to take part in this work and to the glory of God. We see they did. They did want to take part in this work. The Bible says that these people rejoice because they offered so willingly. I submit that what you find in that verse is exactly what God has always wanted from his people. It is exactly what God wanted from Adam and Eve in the garden. It is exactly what God wanted from the nation of Israel throughout their history. It is exactly why, what God wants from me, what he wants from you. While God could certainly force us to serve him. While God could certainly have made us programmed robots who are designed automatically to love him and give him our best effort, while God could certainly do that just like that, he doesn't do that. He has never done that. He has never forced anybody to serve him. Joshua wanted the children of Israel to understand that in Joshua 24, 15, right? Remember Joshua 24, verse 15, Joshua told the people, choose now this day who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. This is a choice. And then, you know, the most well-known verse in the Bible, you know it. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. That's a choice. She'll not perish, but have everlasting life. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's a choice. And then go over to Psalm 110. I want to show you something in Psalm 110. This is a psalm written by David. It may be familiar to you, but listen carefully to the language. In Psalm 110 in verse number one, in Psalm 110 in verse one, David wrote these words. He says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will, will volunteer freely in the day of your power and holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I know verses 1 and 4 are familiar to you. Those passages are quoted in the New Testament, right? Those passages are a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the one who fulfills verse number 1. Jesus is the one who fulfills verse number 4. But for the purpose of this lesson, notice verse 3. Notice the language of verse number three. Notice how in verse number three, David talks about God's people volunteering freely in the day of his power. Some of your translations render that language willingly. 
willingly. What is David saying there? What David is saying there is like what he experienced and the people experienced when they were getting ready to build the temple in the kingdom of God, true followers of God willingly serve him. They willingly love him. They willingly give their hearts and their lives to him, and they go above and beyond for him. God doesn't have to force true followers to serve him. God doesn't have to force them to love him and to put him first. God doesn't have to come to them in a vision or a dream or speak directly to them from heaven. God doesn't have to give them a sign or do something special to impress them. No, because God chose to love them first. True followers of God choose to love him back. They choose to commit themselves to him. They willingly give their hearts and their lives to him because he first willingly gave his son on a cross. True followers of God willingly give their hearts and their lives to him, and they do that because they have a great sense of indebtedness. A great sense of indebtedness. We're going back to 1 Chronicles one more time, please. We're going to pick up with verse number 10. After the Bible tells us that the people willingly gave generously to support the building of the temple, it says in verse number 10, So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and in it lies your hand to make great and strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you and from your hand, we have given you. What do we find going on there in those verses? Well, in those verses, you find a prayer. That's a prayer. That is a prayer that David makes to God after he and the people commit themselves to giving generously to support the building of the temple. In this prayer, David expresses his motivation and the nation's motivation to go above and beyond in their giving on this occasion. Notice how in verse 11, in verse 11, David acknowledges God as the creator. He acknowledges God as great and powerful and majestic and the true ruler over all things. In verse number 12, he also acknowledges God as the source of their blessings. He says that God was the reason why they had prospered so much as a nation. He says that God was the reason why they had become great as a nation at this time. He was the reason why they had the things that they had. David understood that God, not himself, God was the source of his blessings. In fact, in verse 13, David expresses thanksgiving. He says something to God that maybe we don't say enough when we pray to God. And that's thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for blessing me so much. Thank you for putting us in this position. Thank you for putting us in a position where we even have something to give to you in the first place. We understand, verse 14, that in the big scheme of things, all we're really doing is we're giving back to you what already belongs to you. You are the God who has blessed us with everything that we have as a nation. And from your hand, from your hand, we have given you. You see, what David is doing in this prayer is he's acknowledging a great sense of indebtedness towards God. He is acknowledging that because God has been so good to them, he was obligated to take part in God's work. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said in Romans. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter one as he wrote to the church in Rome? In Romans chapter one and in verse 14, in Romans one and verse 14, Paul says, I am under obligation. 
both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see the word obligation Paul uses there? That word obligation that he uses there carries the idea of indebtedness. It carries the idea of personal responsibility. Paul says that he felt a great sense of personal responsibility to be involved in the work of God. He felt that way because of what God had already done for him through Jesus Christ. You see, because God provided a way for him to be saved through Jesus Christ, Paul felt he felt a duty to serve God. He felt a duty to glorify God and honor God and especially spread his gospel. That's the kind of spirit that Paul carried with him every day. The question is, do we have that same kind of spirit? Do we have that same kind of spirit even even today, like David and like Paul? Do we have a great sense of indebtedness towards God? Do we live our lives really feeling like we owe God because God is great and powerful and loving and demonstrated his love for us at the highest level 2,000 years ago? Do we have a great sense of obligation to serve him? I submit that if we have that same kind of spirit that Paul and David had, it won't be hard for us. It won't be hard for us to do a daily Bible reading schedule. It won't be hard for us to attend Bible classes and special events like we're having this week. It won't be hard for us to constantly look for ways to serve God's people. It won't be hard for us to park with a sacrificial portion of our money to support God's work like David And the people of Israel did. It won't be hard for us to constantly be looking for ways to spread the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when we truly live lives that are indebted to God and his goodness, evangelism is not a burden. Evangelism is not a chore. Evangelism is not something that we're going to do because God commanded us to do it or because we feel like we have to do it. No, instead, it is something that we want to do. We want to spread the gospel. We want to fulfill the Great Commission. We want to tell other people about the love of Jesus Christ and about how he died to save them just like he died to save us. That's the kind of spirit David had in his life. You see, David, as flawed as he was, and he was a flawed man, he had a heart for God, didn't he? He had a passion for the work of God, what the Queen of Sheba witnessed First hand during the time of Solomon, it actually began with David. It began with David and the citizens of his kingdom. Before Solomon even became the king, David had already submitted to the will of God and he had fully invested himself in this great work. And while that temple is no longer standing in Israel today, we need to understand that God does still have a temple. God has a temple, doesn't he? God has a temple even today. God has something where he dwells among his people even today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and in verse number 16, Paul told the Corinthians, Do you not know that you, you as a church, are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5, Peter says, You also, as Christians... Are being our living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, last verse in Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse number 21, after talking about how Jesus is the cornerstone of the church, in verse 21 he says, In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together. And to a dwelling of God in the spirit. What is Paul saying there? Well, in all those passages, Paul is trying to tell us that the temple of God in existence today 
It's an even greater temple than the one that existed in the time of Solomon. It's an even greater one than the one that David took part in helping construct. It's an even greater one than the one that was seen by the Queen of Sheba and was worshipped in by Old Covenant Israel. Paul says the temple of God today is the church. It is the body of Christ. It is that which is made up of living stones and will never be destroyed. The Old Testament temple merely foreshadowed the greater temple to come. It merely foreshadowed the greater temple that will later be built by someone who is greater than Solomon, and that is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The temple today is the church, and if David wanted God's physical temple to be successful, how much more should we want to see the success of God's spiritual temple today? How much more so should we want others to see the glory of God's spiritual temple today? How much more so should we want to be part of God's spiritual temple today. In fact, maybe you sit there this morning, you realize that you are not part of God's spiritual temple today. Maybe you sit there and you realize that I am not part of the work of God. I am not part of the family of God. God's presence is not with me because I'm not part of his people. If that describes you this morning, then we want to help you we want to help you with that, whether it, whether it means we need to sit down with you and study with you the gospel or if you're ready to respond to the gospel through faith and repentance and baptism and water for the forgiveness of your sins. If there is someone here this morning who needs to become part of the temple of God, we want to help you with that right here and right now. Come to the front. Let's